welcome again. We are on our way to meet Olivier Blanchard at his office at Peterson Institute. Professor Blanchard is the recipient of the 2012 John von Neumann Award of Rye College. We asked him about personal matters, academia, and the main macroeconomic topics he has been focusing on in the past. My name is Olivier Blanchard, or Blanchard in French. Uh, I came to the US now nearly 50 years ago. Uh, I was a professor at MIT until 2008. Mm -hmm. Then I was the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund until during the crisis from 2008 to 2015. I'm now retired from MIT. Formerly I'm called a professor emeritus. And I'm a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute in Washington, where we're having uh, this interview. So the, uh, the man who wrote uh, the basic manual on public finance is Richard Musgrave, and he basically distinguished between three functions of fiscal policy. One was allocation, the other was distribution, and the third one was stabilization. So we're talking about the third one. So in general, when monetary policy can be used freely, when the central bank can move interest rates as it wants, then most of the job of stabilization should be done by the central bank. Fiscal policy may have to play a role. For example, there is something called automatic stabilizers, which are automatic increases in revenues, and this can work faster than monetary policy. So even if monetary policy works, there might be some room for fiscal policy. But when fiscal policy becomes much more important, and that's the case today, is when monetary policy is constrained. You know, interest rates are either at zero or very close to zero, in which case monetary policy cannot be used to push demand, and you have to use fiscal policy. And what I've been arguing that is that we are now in a regime which may last many years, uh, may, not for, may not last forever, but may last many years, in which monetary policy is going to be constrained, and therefore fiscal policy has to be used more than it used to be. I think sometimes, actually, fiscal policy could help monetary policy. For example, if in Europe the fiscal policy was a bit more expansionary, right? so we had slightly larger deficits, this would allow the ECB, for example, to increase interest rates, and we would be able to avoid negative interest rates, which are probably not a very good thing. How would you describe a channel through which an increase in public debt could be welfare increasing? The government can issue safe assets, safe debt, more so than the private sector. Right? If you're a firm, you issue debt, well, there's a chance that you know, things don't go well and you go bankrupt. If you're the government, if things go well, you tax more. Right? So the, the, the power to tax, in effect, means that you can borrow, and most of the time, not always, but most of the time, it's not risky. So the government can create safe assets much better than the private sector, right? And so government debt, in that respect, is a good thing for investors, right? Because this gives them a safe asset if they want a safe asset. So that doesn't mean, so this is the basic point. A sophistication on that is that that doesn't imply that you can have gross debt, net, a lot of gross debt. You could basically, if you think that it is useful for the private sector to have safe assets, you could buy, as a government, private assets and then issue debt. Your net debt would not change. Then we asked the professor about the possible risk of higher debts. So, yes, so basically debt is bad because it displaces capital, and if capital is productive enough, that's not good. Okay. There is, so, if I increase debt in the US today, okay, say I go from whatever it is at this stage, depending on the statistic you use, but 80% to 85%, I would say that's not good, right? Because it displaces capital. But the investors are not going to worry very much. The US government can repay if that is 85%. It can repay if that is 120%, right? If that got to 200% or 300%, then you get into a different game, which is that debt is no longer considered safe. 
And that can be very bad. You know, this is what happens in Latin America and other places. You get to a level of debt where the investors say, well, you say it's safe, but it's not. Then debt becomes risky. You have to pay more. The economy typically goes down the drain. Next, we asked him whether he thought the Eurozone needs more risk sharing. Yes, but it's not the most important thing. Okay. Uh, I think having better fiscal rules would be good, even if there is no risk sharing. I think allowing countries uh, to have larger deficits if mm-hmm. unemployment is too high, uh, having more flexible rules would go a long way without any risk sharing. Uh, so that would be the, the first point. The second point is risk sharing would help. And suppose that you know, a country has high unemployment, or a large, what we call a, ne- a large negative output gap, so activity is too low. But financial markets are a bit worried about its debt. I'm thinking of Italy, right? At this stage, Italy is reluctant, for reasons I understand, to spend more, have larger deficits because first they would violate the European Union rules, and in addition, markets would think, well, what are these guys doing, mm-hmm. right? So in this case, risk sharing would be clearly very useful. So if, for example, the European Commission could issue euro bonds, you know, which okay. basically would be backed by everybody, and then distribute the money or lend the money to uh, Italy, that would be good, but there would be risk sharing. After talking about issues related to macroeconomics, we shifted to a more broader question. We were interested in his views on the balance between theoretical and empirical research. So I think that you have to have not one size fits all. So I think you have to have people who think at a really abstract level, and then you have to have people with their hands dirty. And where you situate yourself as a researcher is a matter of preferences, right? Some people are incredibly good at basically using math and can work at a really abstract level and will create models which are not directly useful but are, you know, very insightful. And then there are people who really want to solve, you know, the social security problem in country X. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a continuum. Mm -hmm. And as a researcher, you have to decide where you are. I think you have academia. You have policy making. There are some institutions in the middle, like the Fed in the US, which has a lot of researchers which do applied work. You have the IMF, you have the World Bank. But it's true that too often I think people in academia don't really know enough about the world to make a contribution Mm -hmm. and are not good enough as theorists to make a major contribution. So if I were a benevolent dictator, which I don't want to be, you have enough of those. Um, I would have more people in the middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I would have academia be more in touch with uh, the real world. I think it's happening slowly. It depends on the country. How do you see the conflicts between economic policy research and political decision making? That's a good question. Um, again, my sense is politicians listen when there's a crisis. Otherwise, they don't. Uh, So, you know, the reason we talk much more about inequality is that inequality has led to populism. And I can think of countries where this is mildly relevant. Uh, Unnamed countries. Uh, And then, if the government wants to stay in power, either it goes populist, which again sometimes happens, or it actually thinks of ways to satisfy some of the anger and so on. So I. I'm hopeful that as inequality becomes a bigger and bigger issue, some governments will go at least the right way. I'm worried that some governments will go the wrong way. If they go the right way, then the work that we do as researchers, as academics, is then useful and they are willing to listen. And if we say, well, if you do this, it will make a difference, they listen. One one should hope. Lastly, we asked the professor why he chose to become an academic scholar. Uh, that would be a long answer, but the short one is, uh, I was 20 years old in 1968, and 1968 in France was a time in which the students decided to make a mess. 
uh, questioned uh, capitalism and various other things, and I was part of that movement. Uh, and uh, I concluded that the way to make a difference to the world was actually among the social sciences, economics was the one which had the most chance of you know, being useful. So uh, that gave me the motivation. And then I found that the mix between social issues, really important questions which make a difference. You know, if you have something to say, it makes a difference to the world. And the use of analytical tools, math, uh, being, you know, having to be very precise about what you say and what you, what you prove, is a very nice mix. And the notion of using techniques at the service of social issues is a very rare pleasure. Uh, so, you know, I've done this for 50 years and I kind of like it, something like that. <laughs>